They are elected by you. I am elected by you. I'm constrained as they are constrained by a system that our founders put in place. The founders separated power because they knew it was the best way to protect our citizens. Keep your eye on the ball. Structure is uh, structure is destiny. destiny. This is Necessary and Proper, the podcast of the Federal Society's Article One Initiative. All views expressed on this podcast do not necessarily reflect those of the Federal Society. On November 5th, 2021, the Federal Society's Evansville Lawyers Chapter hosted an event titled How to Fix the Budget Mess, featuring David Hopi. The following is the recording from that event. We hope you enjoy. All right, everyone, thank you for your patience. I uh, wanted to give uh, folks an opportunity to, uh, to join us uh, as it is uh, the lunch hour for, for many, many uh, participants. Uh, my name is Seth Zirkel. I serve on the leadership committee here of the Evansville uh, Lawyers Chapter uh, of the Federal Society. I want to thank um, first and foremost, uh, the organization, uh, home office, as I like to call it, for hosting this event um, uh, on their Zoom account. Uh, today's presentation is being recorded, um, and so uh, kindly ask if um, individuals um, need to ask a question that we utilize the question and answer function. Uh, for those that are on a, uh, an iPhone and participating by uh, remote, I believe, remotely, uh, on their phone, uh, the Q&A uh, icon is at the top. Uh, for those of you that are on a, um, a Mac or computer desktop, I believe the Q&A icon is along the bottom. Um, today's presentation will uh, include uh, remarks given, prepared remarks given by, by David, and then we will open up the floor to questions and answers. Um, I want to extend a warm welcome to, to Dave Holpe uh, and thank him for, for being here today. Um, this presentation, I think, is, is especially prescient given um, what is currently going on uh, in Washington, D.C. Uh, Dave's background uh, uniquely qualifies him to, to offer up uh, some suggestions and observations uh, to the budgetary process. After serving for 29 years on Capitol Hill, uh, he returned to the private practice and serves as uh, president of Open Strategies, uh, strategic planning, uh, lobbying, and a political consulting firm. Uh, he brings a wealth of experience uh, into this job, having dealt with the legislative development and strategy at the highest levels on Capitol Hill. He directed the WIP offices in both the House and the Senate, uh, a unique aspect on being both sides of, uh, of, the, of the building, uh, and led Senate Majority Leaders' uh, office during the Clinton and Bush 43 administrations. Uh, in both positions, he oversaw and coordinated the flow of legislation through Congress, and, um, and both required working with political personalities on both sides of that aisle. Um, he uh, recently reprised this office or this role um, for Senator Kyle in the uh, Senate Whip's office. Um, I am uh, very happy to, to, to report that some of his highlights uh, for years in the House included leadership uh, roles uh, on leadership staff, uh, where the passage of the Economic Recovery Tax Act of 81, the Omnibus Budget Reconciliation Act of 81, uh, both were key elements of, of the first rate administration. Uh, and working with Representative Jack Kemp, uh, he worked uh, and was an integral part of the passage of the Tax Reform Act of 1986 and the Budget Balanced Budget Act of 97. In 2003, he left the Hill to work for the Public Affairs Office of Quinn Galipsy, uh, Galipsy and Associates. Um, I'm uh, very happy to turn the floor over to uh, Dave this morning, this afternoon, and um, warmly welcome his comments. Seth, thank you very much. Appreciate the opportunity. Um, what I'd like to do is sort of walk through the budget, where we are um, with the budget process, make some suggestions that I think would help improve the budget process, and then take questions and perhaps have a conference, more of a conversation uh, with all of you about budget and what's happening. That's where we can get into the detail of what's happening right now, such as one can know it with uh, things moving as quickly and changing as quickly as they have been in the past 48 hours. But I first came to Capitol Hill in January of 1976, which was right as they were adopting and implementing the Budget Empowerment and Control Act, which had passed. Uh, uh, they really were able to pass it because Richard Nixon was um, in the throes of Watergate. And the Congress decided that they, it was a Democrat Congress and a strongly Democrat Congress, decided that they would make some changes because they felt the executive branch had too much knew too much power and too much authority over the budget. And the Congress uh, was not able to match 
uh, that sort of action. The other thing they wanted to do is stop some of the actions that Nixon had taken as president, where he would aggr had aggressively impounded monies. And at that point, uh, it was before they had made it impossible for the president to impound more than a certain amount of monies. Uh, it was possible for a president to say, Congress, you might have voted these appropriations, but I'm just not going to spend them. It's not that he could put them someplace else necessarily, but he could not spend them. And they didn't like that either. So Congress passed the Budget Impoundment and Control Act in 1974, and it phased in over a couple of years. Um, and the final phase in was in 1976, calendar year 76, where they took the start of the fiscal year from July 1st to October 1st. So that fiscal year, we had a fiscal year, and then we had a transition quarter from July 1st, 1976, to September 30th, 1976. And then we started the new fiscal year, uh, 1977 fiscal year on October 1st of 1976. So I've been in Washington for almost all of the, uh, the period of time that which we have acted under the Budget Empowerment and Control Act. And it really was a fairly significant change. In fact, I recall seminars uh, that both parties used to do for staff people walking them through this new budget process and how it worked and what could be done. And over the years, as the budget process has been implemented and used, uh, it has changed that I think some of the things that the people who wrote the bill thought would happen uh, have not happened and other things like reconciliation, which we're dealing with now, has become very important. For the first three or four years, there was no reconciliation used, but in 1980, uh, the Democrats started using reconciliation and the Reagan administration used it later on. And you then started growing and seeing the use of reconciliation in the 80s and 90s. And it has become a very powerful tool. In fact, one of the most powerful tools in the budget process is the reconciliation bill. Let me just go through sort of how it works as quickly as I can. I'll try and do this in you know, 60 seconds or so. Um, Congress has the responsibility that if you look at the Budget Act, it says the president will pre present a budget usually by the end of January, or early February. Congress will receive that budget. Congress will start to have hearings on that budget. Congress will produce a budget by uh, April 15th and they'll produce. Uh, and after that, if they want to, they can then go forward and produce another bill called a reconciliation bill. Very few times has Congress met these um, the dates that are in the bill. So they are more notional than they are um, really limit, limitations on Congress and what it can do and how it does it. But the critical thing about the budget is that, is that the budget that Congress passes does not go to the president for signature. It is a concurrent resolution. When Congress passes the same version of it both in both the House and the Senate, that is the budget which Congress works off of. The president doesn't obviously has input into that insofar as he provides a budget and the Congress usually works off his budget to establish their own budget. But this is not a presidentially signed bill. If you produce the same budget and that budget has in it what we call reconciliation instructions, and the reconciliation instructions are really just uh, a set of, of, of proposed numbers to the committees of jurisdiction over taxes and any other programs that the Congress wants to include in reconciliation. And it tells those committees how much money they have to raise or how much money they have to, to spend, what their deficit might be, how the, and, they, and they come up with the, the proposals and ideas of how to do that. So the budget itself, the budget, and the budget committee suggests to them how they might do it but it is within the power of the Ways and Means Committee or the Finance Committee or the uh, Commerce Committee or the uh, Help Committee on the Senate side, when they get their instructions on a reconciliation bill, it is up to their, it is their responsibility to, uh, to then put together a bill which matches the numbers that they have been given by, this, by, the, by the budget that has passed both the House and the Senate. A reconciliation bill is a piece of legislation that must pass the House and the Senate in the same, with the same language and be uh, signed by the president like other legislation. It is not a concurrent resolution like the Budget Act itself is. It is a bill that changes law, changes spending, changes tax law, whatever may be included in there. 
Um, and so you've got uh, this situation where the reconciliation bill has now become one of those bills which we use, uh, for example, uh, in, um, in, 20, um, in 2001, the Republicans used the reconciliation bill to get the Bush tax cuts, um, the Bush, Bush tax cuts passed. In 2009 and 2010, the Democrats used the reconciliation bill as part of the, of the bill that established the ACA, the Obamacare. And the Republicans in 2017 used the reconciliation bill to get taxes, and they used a second reconciliation bill to try and change health care. They were unsuccessful in passing the second bill or, or the, the reconciliation bill for health care, but that's what they were trying to use. Right now, what we see going on in the Biden administration this year uh, in the Democratic Congress, um, Democratic controlled Congress and the Biden administration is using the reconciliation bill to, to begin and put into place, uh, if you will, the, the, the seeds for a number of new programs, uh, whether it be parental leave, whether it be pre-kindergarten, whether it, it be some expanding healthcare, expanding Medicaid, expanding Medicare, um, providing for, uh, for um, uh, vision and hearing and dental care in Medicare. These are all things which they're trying to put into the reconciliation bill. And that's the, the reconciliation bill thus has become one of the major ways of, of achieving legislative goals. And the reason it is, is because under the budget and reconciliation bill, you do not have the power to filibuster in the Senate and it takes only a simple majority vote in the Senate. Uh, to pass it. Now, I, I limit that to the Senate because it always takes a simple majority vote in the House to pass any piece of legislation. So you've got um, in the House, it, uh, they, use, they use the budget process to do that as well, but more because it allows them to do, to do it without filibuster and without needing to get 60 votes for cloture, for example, on a piece of legislation like you would have to on an appropriations bill, like you would have to on uh, on a normal bill, uh, changing the rules and reg regulations and, and law on Medicaid, for example. If you did that under regular order in the Senate, it would take 60 votes for cloture at some time during that process. So people, so, so both parties have used the reconciliation bill when they didn't think they could get 60 votes in the Senate and they wanted to do, uh, they wanted to make fairly fundamental or, or, or strong uh, powerful changes in tax legislation and healthcare legislation and other types of legislation. Um, and the budget um, has, in addition to allowing it to, uh, allowing the bill to pass with 50, there are some restrictions in the Senate on the budget and what everybody talks about as the bird, uh, bird restrictions. And there's five or six different things there, but the major one is that uh, what you put into a reconciliation bill, the main purpose of that has to be for, fi for a financial purpose for the government, not to change po uh, uh, policy, law policy. For example, that's the argument that they've been having in the Senate on immigration and whether they are able to put immigration and changes in the immigration law into the reconciliation bill. Thus far, the parliamentarian whose advice is only um, it's only advice. The parliamentarian doesn't rule. The parliamentarian gives advice to the chair and the chair rules, but the chair most often follows the parliamentarian's advice. The parliamentarian in the Senate has said they've made three or four attempts at trying to figure out how to write a change in immigration law to put it in the reconciliation bill. And the parliamentarian thus far has said uh, that, the parliament, that the parliamentarian's office does not believe that that passes the bird rule test. But that's not the only issue put before the, the that runs through this bird test in the Senate. The bird test was first put into the Budget uh, Act in 1985, and then it was put into law in 1990. So the bird restrictions on what you can do in a Senate reconciliation bill are part of the law. They're not just part of precedent and some Senate rules, they're part of the law itself, the budget law, as it has changed since it was first implemented in 1974. The process that we're going through right now that you're looking at in the House um, is, um, 
it, it, it obviously is a very political process. And so we've gotten to the point where the Democrats see this as their last best chance to get this uh, fairly significant, the, the fairly significant changes. Um, uh, people are familiar with uh, President Biden when he first came into office, had a number of his Democrat historians um, come into the White House and, and encourage him to be the FDR of his time and, and place in the country. Um, he doesn't have the majorities like FDR had in the Congress in 33 and 34, well, had in the Congress, frankly, for almost all of the years he was president, but certainly had it in 33 and 34. Um, and he doesn't have those majorities, but he's he is trying to make the same fundamental changes in government in different areas uh, that um, uh, that FDR made and trying to add a, a, a significant number of new entitlements uh, as were added during the Great Society years uh, when Lyndon Johnson had overwhelming numbers. Um, uh, really, they were um, they were filibuster proof and they were veto proof numbers um, after the uh, after the 1964 uh, elections. And so in 65 and 66, um, the uh, President Johnson, many of the Great Society programs were implemented when the Democrats had complete control of the government in the, in the legislative and the executive branches. Um, so we are now operating, if you will, in where the president has some of the slimmest majorities. Uh, the, there is no majority in the Senate. The Senate majority is determined by the vice president. There's a 50-50 split in the Senate and the vice president being a Democrat makes, it the, makes the Democrats the majority, but they've got 50 seats and the Republicans have 50 seats. You have a slight majority in the House of, uh, of about, uh, I think actually right now it's eight. Uh, there's, uh, there's eight more Democrats in the House of Representatives than there are Republicans, which is a fairly slim majority. If you look at the history of it, there uh, there's, haven't been many times when the majority in the House has been this, this small a majority number. But they are trying to move forward with many new entitlement programs. So. Um, we, what we see happening right now is a very uh, aggressive political move on the part of the speaker. After the results of the elections Tuesday um, in Virginia, most particularly, but throughout the nation, but Virginia being one of those states, one of the two states that elects a governor in the uh, off-year election after a new president is elected, um, the Republicans did very well, and the Democrats had some problems in, in, in terms of, of, uh, of their votes in, in Virginia, but also if you look around at New Jersey, which is the other state that does this, the Democrat who was the incumbent, uh, appears to have won re-election in New Jersey, but there are a number of other things that happened in the state, uh, you know, the, 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 the state legislature in New Jersey and the state legislature in Virginia, which seem to show that people are unhappy right now with uh, with the direction that is being taken in some parts, you know, on some parts of the legislation by President Biden and the Democratic majorities. And Speaker Pelosi decided that what she would do, she had basically two options at this point, step, step, step back and say, okay, let's figure out what we want to do. Clearly, there's some ha unhappiness with what we've been trying to do here and uh, step back and give it some time and work it through. That was Mr. Manchin, Senator Manchin's advice. Uh, she chose to go the other direction, which is let's get this done now because the House is scheduled to be on recess next week back in their districts talking to their constituents. And the speaker is afraid that when, if they go back there before they vote, when they come back here, she'll never get the votes to pass this. So before they leave town today, she wants to vote both on the reconciliation bill uh, the called the Build Back Better bill of the Biden administration, as well as the bipartisan infrastructure bill or called the BIF bill. She wants to vote on both of those. Um, and it's not clear that she has the votes on both of them. It's, I think it's pretty, I think it's more likely she'll have the votes on the bipartisan infrastructure bill, but it's not as clear she'll have the votes on the reconciliation bill. But we may know if she thinks she has the votes, she's going to get to that vote as quickly as she can. Um, and if she doesn't, she still may take the vote just to, sometimes my old boss, Trent Lott, used to say, 
you, to get the votes, you got to take the vote. And she may be in that position today. Let me spend two or three minutes on just how I think we ought to be looking at changing uh, the budget structure, because I think it's become, um, it's been used in, not in the way intended by those who originally wrote it. And I think we could do a better job of, uh, of, of, le of legislating if we would change some of the things about the Budget Act. And the, the first point I want to make is, if you look at the Constitution, the most important power of the legislature is the power of the purse. That's where their real power and control over the executive branch comes. If you look at the past generation and a half, uh, the Congress has been more and more not completing appropriations bills, but doing omnibus bills or doing continuing resolutions, which simply say you continue last year's appropriations for a certain period of time, sometimes through the whole fiscal year. Um, and this has gotten to the point where Congress, instead of dealing with all the details of these different bills, takes them as such a big package that nobody can really know what's in them very well. And they're not debated in the way that they ought to be debated if you wanted a Congress to have their power over the spending of the executive branch and to use uh, their constitutional power to give them leverage to get the uh, to get the executive branch to do what Congress might want the executive branch to do. Um, so my view is that we ought to look at that as being the most important thing that Congress does instead of the thing we save for last, doing it up against a deadline sometime and start by um, by having a, a, at the start of each Congress, uh, each year at the start of the Congress and start of the, uh, of the first session of Congress and then the, and at the start of the second session of Congress, have a budget which starts by figuring out what your revenues are going to be. Most people who budget don't say, gee, this is how much I'm going to spend, and then say, gee, uh, I'm only going to make half that. Well, <laughs> I'm going to have trouble spending that if I only make half, it, right? So the, the budget process to me ought to start with revenues, what you want them to be, how you're going to raise them. And I think you could use the basic budget process we have now and take the first month, six weeks of the year to figure out what your revenues are going to be. Then you go back in and figure out what your spending's gonna be. Now, if you decide you wanna spend more than you're taking in, fine, but you're gonna to have to do that on the basis of this is how much we expect to take in this year through our policies, and this is how much we expect to spend more or less than we're taking in. Then you would, if you have those two going, then the next thing you would do is say that the appropriations bills have to come and be finished before the end of May. If you have a process which gets you the budget, and then reconciliation and then appropriations bills, excuse me, before the end of May and take up no legislation. There may be some emergency legislation you have that would come in here and there and you'd just take that up if you needed to. But by and large, let there be no legislation other than the Budget Act and doing the budget process, no reconciliation, that would be saved for later, do the budget process and then do the appropriations process and get that done by the end of May and spend all your time doing that. That's the most important job of Congress, is telling the executive branch how much money they have to spend, where to spend it, how to spend it, on what programs to spend it. And Congress ought to be dedicated to that, in my opinion, as the first thing they do in each session of Congress, not the last thing they do in each session of Congress. So let me stop there and, uh, and take any questions people might have. All right, Dave, thank you so much for that. Those are very remarks, very insightful, very helpful. Um, I would welcome any of our uh, participants today to uh, go ahead and uh, provide a, uh, any questions, raising questions. Well, I will use the uh, uh, prerogative of the uh, co-presenter to, to not use the Q&A function, but would welcome anyone else to, to do so. Please uh, feel free to, uh, to raise a question, but they'll bring this to you. So to a layman uh, listening in uh, to uh, the news, reading blogs, reconciliation, reconciliation, reconciliation. This is what we hear over and over and over and over again. Um, you mentioned that the, the rise of that uh, being used in the last 20 to 30 years 
give your thoughts on the appropriateness of that. I mean, obviously, it's a very subjective standard and, and depends on you know, who's in control, whether or not it's a boogeyman or not. But um, any additional thoughts on the appropriateness of that to sort of kind of become the default versus, as you said, more or less what we might consider to be um, a proper role of, of taking the time, as Manchin and others have said, to see what's in these uh, spending bills. Um, like your thoughts on that historically, how it has been used in some of the battles uh, from your time and experience on the Hill, um, whether there's any precedent for this. I mean, there's nothing new under the sun, right? So uh, we welcome your insight on that. Yeah, well, let, let me start by saying that um, I think we've, one of the great problems of the legislative branch of the federal government, and one of the pro reasons it's as weak as it is, is because they have um, gotten away from the debate, debates and votes on issues. And what you have is in both bodies, um, both the House and the Senate, no matter who is in a majority control, Republicans or Democrats, have seemed to fall back into this um, letting the leadership make all the decisions and impose their specific will on members so that instead of being active in committee or subcommittee, working on a piece of legislation, which will go through the subcommittee, go through the full committee, be marked up, go to the floor, get voted on, have opportunity to provide votes in the House and the Senate both, um, what we have is that the leadership will determine sort of which, which bills they want to come up. And most of the, the most important point for the leadership right now, once again, whether the Democrats are the majority, Republicans in the majority, House or Senate, is how do I keep um, my, my members from having to vote on so many things. Um, the reason you get the big butts, bucks in being a legislator and being a congressman or being a senator is because you're supposed to get up there and make decisions. And decisions are, are made by voting. And to the degree we've gotten away from allowing the process of in subcommittee, full committee, on the floor, having votes to solve our problems, I think we've gotten away from having uh, the, the legislature be uh, both uh, a, a successful and active legislature. Um, and the weakening of the legislature is, in, in my opinion, tied to this um, leadership control. Uh, and if we would start moving back to people being allowed to offer amendments, I think what you find when people offer amendments is that the, the, the sort of um, the the, the the fight, the, the fighting itself, you know, scraping back and forth, offering amendments, finding out you don't have the votes, listening to somebody else and realizing that if you change that amendment a little bit, you might be able to get enough votes to get it passed in subcommittee. And then having the right, once you take it to subcommittee and full committee, for it to be actually the bill that appears on the floor, as opposed to the leadership saying, thank you, patting you on the head and saying, thank you for giving us this bill. Now we'll change it the way we want it, and then we'll vote on it. Sorry, <laughs> ignore all your work. That's, I think that's one of the big problems we have right now. I think we start there as a problem and, and the place to start in, in having more votes to my way of thinking, as I said earlier, is the appropriations process. Um, as regards your specific question on reconciliation, I think that reconciliation can be a valuable and useful tool. However, if it is the only tool um, it, it is like any other situation where you use tools. If you have the right tool, you can do a lot of things very well. But that means you have a number of tools that you use. If you have one tool, um, a screwdriver is a pretty good screwdriver. It makes a lousy hammer. Just as a hammer is very helpful for pounding in a nail, but not very helpful for getting out a screw. Um, having different tools to do different jobs is valuable. So I think the tool of reconciliation can be valuable. The problem is we've let it become a catch-all, and that's a problem. And shouldn't, and in fact, Congress putting all these things into into one bill, whether it be a, a an omnibus appropriations bill, whether it be a reconciliation bill, uh, whether it be you know the um, any other large piece of legislation that that pulls from two or three different places or different broad issues. Um, is not a valuable way, in my opinion, or an effective way for the legislative branch to use its power 
and to make decisions. And so while I have, I don't have a problem with reconciliation, I do worry about um, the fact that reconciliation is now being used as one of very few tools and oftentimes used as a tool to do something it's not made to do. For example, um, reconciliation is a very poor way of dealing with immigration issues. Um, as a part of this reconciliation bill, the Democrats in the House would like to put in would like to put in immigration changes, and the Democrats in the Senate would like to do it as well. But you won't have a full debate on that on those issues if they're put in there. I think that the parliamentarian will probably say you can't put immigration. I mean, anything you do to raise money from immigration is just incidental to the fact that you want to fundamentally change integration po immigration policy. Excuse me. And so I, my guess is that the, uh, the parliamentarian will continue to advise that, um, that putting immigration into a reconciliation bill uh, does not pass the burden test, um, but uh, we'll see. But that's what I mean to say, it, it's, a, it's a very, in many ways, a very blunt instrument uh, to be used as, as, as a really broad way of, of trying to legislate on different issues. And so um, you ought to use a better tool and that would be an individual piece of legislation to achieve what you want to achieve. Fine, put an immigration bill on the floor and see what happens. Let people um, try and amend it, go back and forth, offer their ideas and see what happens. There's nothing wrong with that. In fact, there, it's, it's not really wrong even sometimes to bring a bill to the floor of the House or Senate and fail. I remember when I was working for Senator Lott, he was the majority leader this was the time where we were having all these settlements that were done by the attorneys general in different states with the tobacco companies. And Senator Lott finally decided maybe it would be useful to do something at the federal level. And so we had two or three committees that all wanted jurisdiction. Judiciary obviously wanted it. Commerce wanted it. And Senator Lott decided that he would use the bill reported out of the Commerce Committee, mostly because the Commerce Committee was much more bipartisan. The Judiciary Committee has historically been a very partisan committee. And they find it difficult to find common ground on most anything. The Commerce Committee in the Senate, on the other hand, uh, used to do a lot of work in a bipartisan, uh, bipartisan manner. So he used that as the base bill and brought it to the floor. We spent five weeks on the floor of the Senate and ended up that he couldn't get cloture. And he just said, I've tried, <laughs> you know, I've done what I can, but we got to move on. We got appropriations bills, got to get them done. I'm sorry, we're just dropping this. Now he didn't get a piece of legislation passed on this, but they did advance several ideas, which became a part of the grand settlement that was made by a wide number of states and the tobacco companies, the ultimate settlement that they had on this. So it was a valuable part of an exercise to solve an issue in the United States at the time, even though it didn't result in any legislation uh, from the House of the Senate. So just the very fact of dealing with issues and legislating and trying to legislate can be a valuable way of doing things. Um, uh, once again, that requires votes. And you got to let members have their, their ability to offer amendments and vote on them. And the more they do, and the less the, the leadership tries to protect them or control them, I think the better legislature we're going to have. Thank you for that answer. Very, very insightful and helpful. Um, we have uh, one question from a participant. Uh, and the question is, would the proposed change in the budgeting process you describe, in your opinion, do anything about the issues we're seeing in Congress, about the legislative process, about cramming the majority party's entire, quote unquote, wish list agenda into giant omnibus bills? Would that require further procedural reforms? It would, uh, it would definitely require some procedural reforms in the Budget Act as it stands right now. Uh, in fact, some fairly significant ones. But I think the reason it would change things is this, that uh, if you would go, to, go back to doing appropriations bills as 12 individual bills and actually have the debate on them, you would find that a lot of issues are brought out. For example, you do the defense appropriations bill and the defense, the home armed services committees um, are going to be uh, watching what you're doing there. And the, and so you'll have this process will be building, giving more opportunity for a range of members, all members to be involved in the debate. 
And if you if that's the process, but you if you make that sort of change in the process, you start doing things incrementally because you you allow yourself the time to do them incrementally. Part of the reason we have the huge omnibus appropriations bills is because we wait till the end of the year to do them, and then you don't have time to work through 12 individual bills. Well, if you had, if you took the time and said, we're going to finish appropriations before we do anything else, you took the time to do that, then you would have the time to do each of the 12 appropriations bills. And even one by one, they're huge bills. But it's not like when you do them as four or five at a time at a time in a small omnibus or minibus or whatever one wants to call it, or you do two or three at a time. When you once you do that, you know, you've included agriculture and you're also doing um, uh, you know, interior bill, uh, and you're doing um, uh, um, the justice department of justice bill. You do those three as a package. What do they have to do with each other? And the answer is nothing. They were divided into twelve individual appropriations bills to find to try and find a manageable way of dealing with subjects that have a like something about a like about them. And when you start jamming these individual bills together you have less chance to have real debates on them. And I think real debates are what we need. Second thing I think would happen is if you started to do it this way, you would see that um, you don't have to do everything at once. I'm not saying it's magic, it's not magic, but if you see that the legislative process, process is working and bills are coming to the floor and you're getting legislation um, that, and you're getting votes on legislation, you're having the chance to write it to either succeed in passing it or fail on it, but you're getting the opportunity for the, the legislative branch of the government to do their job. Um, and uh, that's, once you start doing that, I think what you'll find is people will feel it less necessary to focus on two or three big bills a year and start to do the incremental stuff. And I'm hoping that will as well have an impact on doing oversight. Um, Neither, in my opinion, neither the House or the Senate does very good oversight anymore. Uh, certainly not. Uh, I think the most recent example of effective oversight, although I wasn't always a big fan of watching what happened when he did it, was uh, Congressman John Dingell from Michigan, who, when he was chairman of the Commerce Committee in the House of Representatives, uh, used to have really, really serious oversight hearings. I remember one hearing he had where whoever it was from the administration, it probably was maybe Reagan administration. And the gentleman who was testifying was in his seventies. And they started at eight that morning. And at about 11 o'clock, this guy was being grilled by Dingell and the other Democrats, but mostly Dingell and his lawyers, passed a note up saying, could I go to the bathroom? And Dingell took the note and he said, nope, no break, stay, stay sitting right there. I mean, this guy was serious about oversight and tried to put you in a very tough adversarial situation. I don't agree with taking it that far, but there are very few people who use oversight the way John Dingell used oversight. And um, as I said, I didn't always agree with him. And he was an engineer who ran the train. And if you got run over by the train, that was tough luck. He really didn't care. But he did focus on oversight and make the people in the executive branch come up and justify what they were doing. Uh, and that's what oversight ought to be. I'm, I would hope that if Congress gets back to legislating, they would see that there's a value to oversight because oversight will give them the information they need to legislate. Thank you for that. And I will look to see here. And uh, all right, well, that is the only other question we have. I'll give uh, just a moment here. If anyone else has a question to submit it and finish that. Okay, well, I see no other questions. I wanna thank you, Dave, for taking the time to present to us today. This was uh, very, very engaging. Um, I want to also thank our, our participants. Uh, this chapter uh, is only, uh, it's very nation. We're only two years into this. Um, and uh, it's, it's only through participation of uh, members of the Evansville and wider community. One of the great things Dave, about these Zoom uh, presentations is uh, we are able to have participants from outside of, of the Evansville, Indiana area to participate in, and, to, and to frankly learn uh, from, from uh, information. For those of you who are local uh, or who would like to come and uh, visit uh, beautiful Evansville, 
January 10th, save the date, next year, noon central uh, here at the historic courthouse. We will be having uh, Gray Music, uh, who's the director of litigation for the Southeastern Legal Foundation, present. Um, and his presentation will focus on unequal protection, the effort to, re uh, effort to replace equality with equity. Uh, and will focus on uh, the number of the efforts of his organization as they relate to education reform, which, uh, Dave, to your neck of the woods in Virginia, looked to have been based on all exit polling and data points to have been dispositive. Uh, for very much so. Yeah, very, which, much, very important. Which you know, it's uh, uh, yeah, uh, touch, touch, uh, touch the weekly paycheck as it relates to bread and butter uh, or my children's education, and you will get parents who otherwise are you know unpolitical to suddenly become politicized. So, Dave, thank you again. Uh, Susanna, my pleasure. And, Happy to be with you. Yeah, thank you for hosting us. And with that, we are adjourned. A good afternoon to everyone. Thank you for listening to Necessary and Proper. If you enjoyed this podcast, please tell a friend and don't forget to subscribe on iTunes or Google Play. To learn more about the Article 1 initiative, please visit fedsoc.org slash article I. That's F-E-D-S-O-C dot org slash article I. This has been a FedSoc audio production.